Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Patricia Pruitt? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing you by this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Patricia Ann Pruitt was born on July 3, 1949, and grew up in Lone Jack, Missouri, which is about 34 miles southeast of Kansas City. Her family ran a 640-acre farm. In seventh grade, Patricia met a classmate named William Edward Pruitt. He went by the name Bill. He had been born on January 10, 1949, so he was about six months older than Patricia. Several years after meeting, when Patricia and Bill were both seniors in high school, they had a class together. They ended up dating. After graduation, they enrolled in the same college. Patricia and Bill married on August 8, 1968, and would go on to have three daughters and two sons, Jane in 1968, Sarah in 1971, Matthew in 1973, Carrie in 1975, and Morgan in 1977. Bill graduated with a degree in education and industrial arts. He worked in a lumber yard. Patricia dropped out of college and took care of the children. In 1976, the couple borrowed $60,000 and purchased a lumber yard in Holden, Missouri. They ran the lumber yard together. The Pruitt family moved into a house, which was also located in Holden. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. On February 18, 1984, at about 3 a.m., Patricia made her way to her neighbor's house and told him that somebody pulled her out of bed and she believed that her husband, Bill, had been hurt. The neighbor was a former law enforcement officer. It took him about an hour to calm Patricia down. After this, he drove to the home of a reserve officer at the north end of Holden. This officer then contacted the police chief. The neighbor and the police went to Patricia's house. When they entered, they found that 35-year-old Bill had been fatally shot two times in the head. Here is the story Patricia supplied to the police. At about 2 a.m., she and her husband returned home after spending time socializing with friends. There were four children in the house that night. Their oldest child, Jane, was at a friend's house. After Patricia and Bill fell asleep, Patricia was awakened by a thunder-like sound. At this point, a mysterious intruder grabbed her by the hair and pulled her out of bed. She said that he wasn't big and he wasn't small. She did not recognize his voice. He smelled like cigarettes and motor oil. Patricia did not know his identity. She could feel something sharp was being held against her throat. The mystery intruder attempted to commit an assault of a sexual nature, but he gave up and left the house. After this, Patricia checked on her husband. She heard gurgling noises. She went to check on her children and realized they were asleep. Patricia went back to the bedroom to check on her husband, but she could not see him well because the lights would not come on. The phone was not functioning either, so calling for help was not an option. She went outside the house and retrieved a flashlight from a pickup truck, then returned to the bedroom. Now, with the benefit of this light, she could tell that there was blood on Bill. Patricia took the children outside to a vehicle and told them to lock the doors. She once again went back inside the house and checked on her husband. He was cold to the touch. Patricia drove to the home of her neighbor. Here's what the police found during their investigation. The phone line to Patricia's bedroom had been cut, and power to the entire house had been shut off from a breaker box in the basement. Bill Pruitt was killed with his own 22 caliber rifle as he was sleeping. The rifle was found three days later in a pond on his property. Patricia initially lied to the police and said that she had never been unfaithful, but after being confronted with evidence to the contrary, she admitted to having three affairs. She claimed that she had the affairs because she had been the victim of an assault of a sexual nature in May 1974. When she told her husband about the attack, he became distant and would no longer have sex with her. On February 24, 1984, six days after Bill's death, Patricia was charged with 
capital murder. She was offered an incredible plea bargain. She could plead guilty to reduced charges and only serve seven years in prison. She refused to take the deal. Her trial started in April 1985. Patricia was convicted of capital murder on April 19 and sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 50 years. She was released on bond as she appealed her conviction. When her appeal was denied in April 1986, she started her prison sentence. Patricia is eligible to be released in 2036 at the age of 86. At the time making this video, Patricia is trying to convince the governor of Missouri to commute her sentence. She is the longest serving female inmate in the Missouri prison system. Now moving to my analysis. Patricia Pruitt has maintained her innocence. Many people believe that she is not guilty. The state, of course, has another opinion. They believe that she murdered her husband as he was sleeping. This brings me to the question, is Patricia guilty of murder? Let's take a look at the evidence both for and against the idea that she is guilty, starting with the inculpatory factors. There was no forced entry into the house that Patricia and Bill shared. The police only found one set of tire tracks near the house, which were from Patricia's vehicle. They were made when she drove to the neighbor's house. It had been raining on the night of the murder, but the mysterious intruder did not leave any footprints. The murder weapon was a 22 caliber rifle, which was found in a pond. It was in 11 inches of water and 15 feet from the bank. A boot print matching Patricia's boot was found on the bank. When the pond was drained, another print matching her boot was found on the bottom near the rifle. This semi-automatic 22 caliber rifle was owned by Bill. He normally kept it unloaded behind a chest of drawers located in a bedroom closet. A box of 22 caliber long rifle cartridges were found in a chest of drawers in the bedroom where Bill was killed. Two cartridges were found in Patricia's jewelry box in the same bedroom. Patricia claimed that after she was attacked, she could hear Bill making gurgling noises, but this was not possible. He was shot in the temple and in the back of the head. The shot to the back of the head would have killed him instantly. Patricia had cuts on her throat which were described as superficial lacerations in a parallel pattern. They were not much more than scratches. Bill had about $93,000 worth of life insurance. The police spoke to Patricia's affair partners. One of them, John Hancock, said that he had an affair with Patricia that lasted for seven months. Patricia told John that she wished her husband, Bill, would be killed in a motor vehicle collision or in some type of accident. She revealed that there was a gun in her house, and thought about killing Bill as he was sleeping. A second affair partner, Richard Hayes, said he had sex with Patricia three times. She asked Richard if he knew of a way of getting rid of Bill and stated that they had plenty of insurance money which would allow Richard to build a lumber yard of his own. It was like she was offering to pay Richard to kill her husband. A third affair partner, Ricky Mitz, said that he had sex with Patricia about once a week over the course of several years. Patricia told him that Bill did not satisfy her. Ricky said that about a year and a half before the murder, Patricia offered him $10,000 to shoot Bill to death. Her plan was to set a fire and send Bill outside to check on it, at which time Ricky could shoot Bill to death. Ricky told Patricia that it was a crazy idea, probably because of the murder part. After Bill was murdered, Ricky told Patricia that he told the police about the statements that she had made. Patricia asked Ricky to tell investigators that he was lying about her statements. She even mentioned the idea of getting married so that Ricky would not have to testify against her in court. Now moving to the exculpatory factors. There were no fingerprints on the rifle and no gunshot residue was on Patricia's hands. One of Patricia's daughters testified that when her mother took her out of the house on the morning of the murder, she heard something downstairs and saw a light on beneath the closed basement door. When the neighbor and the police arrived, the basement door was open. The same daughter said that a few weeks before the murder, the pond on the property was frozen. She was wearing her mother's boots when one of her feet broke through the ice. This could explain the boot print which was found on the bottom of the pond. Patricia was wearing white pajamas on the night of the murder, 
There was no mud on them. The police examined the drains for the sinks and the bathtubs in the house. There was no mud there either. When trying to explain the testimony of her lover, John, Patricia said that she never wished that her husband was dead. As far as Patricia's lover, Ricky, who claimed that Patricia wanted to get married so he could avoid testifying against her, Patricia claimed that it was his idea. She was not attracted to Ricky. Patricia said that she would rather rot in prison forever than to touch him, much less marry him. Some people would argue that spending life in prison and being married are not as different as Patricia described. During the investigation into Bill's murder, Ricky was never a suspect, but Patricia's defense implied that he could have been responsible. For example, Ricky initially lied to the police. He was late for work on the morning of the murder by a half hour to an hour. He was familiar with Patricia's house. He had fired the murder weapon before, and he was a substance user. As far as the insurance policies totaling about $93,000, Patricia was carrying over $170,000 in debt. Her husband was more valuable to her alive. After the conviction, a neighbor claimed that she saw a man driving a car at 12.15 a.m. The man turned around in her driveway and parked near the Pruitt residence. When considering all the evidence, do I think that Patricia Pruitt is guilty of murder? Yes, I believe she is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. In order for Patricia to be not guilty, an extremely unlikely scenario must have occurred. The scenario goes something like this. An assailant decided to target a home containing six people during a thunderstorm in the early morning hours. It just happened to be the residence of a woman who had multiple affairs and repeatedly mentioned how she wanted her husband to be killed. The assailant made his way to the house without leaving tire tracks or footprints. He entered the house without forcing entry. He shut off the power to the house in the basement and cut the phone line. After this, the assailant stumbled upon Patricia and Bill sleeping in their bedroom. He had a knife with him, but he thought to himself, I really wish I had a firearm. I wonder if these people have a gun anywhere in this bedroom. With Patricia and Bill sleeping right next to where he was standing, the assailant rummaged through the closet and found the 22 caliber semi-automatic rifle. He noticed that it was unloaded and thought to himself, there must be cartridges somewhere else in this bedroom. He went to either a chest of drawers or Patricia's jewelry box and found cartridges. The assailant loaded the rifle and murdered Bill. He then decided to use the knife to attack Patricia. After inexplicably giving up, the killer put Patricia's boots on and threw the rifle in the pond. He then put the boots back in the house and left. Patricia put the boots on, took her children to a neighbor's house, and told the neighbor that her husband must be hurt when she already knew he was dead. I guess anything is possible, but I'm pretty sure that Patricia is guilty. Now moving to my final thoughts. One amazing element of this case is how Patricia has been able to convince so many people that she is innocent. Why do people believe her given the strength of the evidence against her? I think what happens here is that over time, people view a murder differently. Initially, everybody feels sorry for the victim and mad at the killer. But over the course of many years, the victim is forgotten and all people hear is the incessant complaining of the killer. Patricia has many concerns about being in prison. She's not happy with the book selections available. She claims to have health problems. And in general, she's miserable. She latched onto this idea that the state unfairly brought up her infidelity and convicted her based on her moral failings and not the evidence. Patricia wants people to believe that she only had affairs because she was the victim of a prior attack and her affair partners were lying about her offering the money to kill her husband. I think that Patricia Pruitt has simply continued to manipulate people from prison. She repeatedly demonstrates why she should never be released. Those are my thoughts on the case of Patricia Pruitt. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.